The next project delivery method is called alliance contracting, or in the United States, it's called integrated project delivery, or IPD. Alliance contracting started in the UK many years ago in offshore oil work, but it's really gained in prominence and stature in Australia, where for years it's been used for large, complex, multidisciplined projects, uh, really very complex jobs that require a much different approach uh, to how the project gets delivered, how it gets executed. Based on the success of the projects using alliance contracting in Australia, it's gaining a lot of favor elsewhere throughout the world. Uh, the results have been very positive in terms of schedule performance and cost performance. We see very high performance characteristics in excess of 95% success ratios, which for large, complex, half a billion dollar projects uh, is very, very rare to see. The way an alliance contract works is that the owner organization will select a designer and will select a contractor and together they will form one single contract entity that they will all be on the same team. As part of that contractual relationship, they will establish a target price and a target schedule and any improvement or any savings to that target price is shared equally or proportionally among the three participants and any pain or any problems or any extra costs associated with the project also is shared proportionally among the three entities, the, op the owner, the designer, and the contractor. The intent here with Alliance Contracting is to create an integrated organization that's focused strictly on the project and not on each other's, not on my individual success, but the success of the overall project. And by doing that, they create an environment contractually where each party is indemnified against the other. So there's a no, uh, no disputes, uh, there's a no, no ability to sue the other party. Everybody can make decisions based on the right solution. The designer doesn't have to worry about over-designing the project to protect themselves. The contractor doesn't have to do things just to protect themselves. They can do what they think is in the right interest of the project to make it the best project, the most effective project, the most cost-effective project, the shortest schedule, while maintaining the quality and the scope of the job and the overall team yields that success. Uh, the idea of not having, of having an indemnification has been a very, very successful criteria in Australia when they're using Alliance projects and is really key to this outcome of yielding that success where all parties can feel comfortable with the other party as well. The structure is very simple. As I said, you have one entity, the project owner, the project designer and the project contractor are all one entity together. There's no interfaces there, they're just one solid team. The last project delivery method I want to talk to here is public-private partnerships or concessions. They're referred to as P3s, PPPs, concessions, uh, and they've been used very successfully throughout the world, Western Europe, Australia, North America, and every year we see PPPs gaining in prominence throughout the world. Some countries, PPPs will reflect up to 10 to 15 percent of the total infrastructure spend in a country in a year, whereas in the United States right now, only about one percent of the infrastructure projects in the United States are being delivered with a P3 methodology. But we see that gaining because of the tremendous backlog and need for infrastructure development the lack of government funding on these projects. So we're seeing the private entities, private lenders and banks coming in and providing financing and taking an equity position in a project. The concessionaire that's put together will involve, would be very similar to a DBOM team, but will also include a financing component where the PPP concession will have a designer, a contractor, an operator, a maintainer, and will provide all of the financing and funding for the project. And the concession will recover those costs plus their profit incentives over the life of the operations of that asset. So the concession now has a requirement and an obligation to build out to the criteria that's been specified, 
but build it out in a way where that asset can perform for 20 or 25 or 30 years at a very specified level that will allow traffic throughput on a highway, that will allow uh, ridership on a rail system, uh, that will allow water to be produced and utilized in service to a community or whatever. That concessionaire will then recover those tolls or those tariffs or those rates and that'll be the way that they recover their money. Uh, they usually will take ridership or capacity or volume risk because they make their own predictions on how successful the project will be and how it'll be able to be utilized. Uh, so they'll have that risk inherent uh, within their team. There's three ways that a P3 concessionaire will recover its costs or its investment. Number one is in the toll rates uh, or the concessions where the completed facilities such as a highway or a, uh, a high speed lane, a dedicated high speed lane, the concessionaire, once the facility is operating, will charge a toll to be used on that and they will recoup that toll revenue. Uh, or if it's a water facility, they'll recover whatever water rates are charged to the public for the capacity of water. The second is an availability payment concession where the concessionaire receives a periodic availability payment from the government on the basis that the completed asset is operating at the rates that they required and specified. It's being operated safely and it's serving the public in a certain way, according to the KPIs or the key performance indicators uh, that have been established in that contract. So as opposed to the concessionaire recovering toll revenues and other revenues, the concessionaire will be paid on an annual basis based on the availability of that asset being open and operating at the specified level. The third way that the concessionaire receives payment is through a shadow toll concession, as we call it. This is a, uh, a set payment that they are paid for every vehicle that uses the facility, used traditionally on a highway project, where they will count the number of vehicles, they will see who utilizes it, and based on that level of volume or that level of usage, they'll receive a shadow toll payment. Uh, back from the government. So they're not collecting the toll revenues on the road itself, but they're receiving a shadow toll payment accordingly. So just in summary, what we'd like to look at today, we've looked at a few things. Number one, there are numerous issues and considerations to take into account when you're developing your project delivery method. One size does not fit all. Just because somebody else had a successful design, bid, build job doesn't mean that you will. You need to look at the specifics of your project, the seven criteria that I talked about to look at your strategy assessment to make sure that those are accounted for, that the risk posture of the project is identified early and that can be factored into the selection model, and the utilization of whatever methodology is going to be dependent on the capability of the people who are managing the project, managing the contract, understanding the risks involved, and if you remember, there's no such thing as a full risk transfer, so don't let anyone ever say that, and to make sure that the project priorities of the owner and the project are taken into account so that they can yield the optimum delivery methodology for you to use. Thank you.